Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. We have a fantastic panel of speakers that I am very happy to introduce. So just by way of just high-level format, uh, I'm going to uh, do a high-level introduction to all three of our panelists uh, to read their full bio. Feel free to go to the events page um, to learn a little bit more about their background and what they, what they do. Um, I will then give a very quick summary of the current uh, situation as we talk about H5N1. And then we'll get right into um, questions to our panelists. Um, for the audience that has joined, if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to put it into the chat box. And um, towards the end of our, our seminar today, I'll look through the chat box and I will um, pose those questions, whether you have it to a specific panelist or to the entire panel uh, towards the, the, the latter half of uh, today's event. Um, so with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce um, our three panelists. I'll start by first introducing David Quammen. He's an American author and journalist whose 18 books include The Song of the Dudo, Spillover, The Tangled Tree, and Breathless, which has which was a finalist for the National Book Award in Nonfiction uh, and the Royal Society uh, Trivedi Science Book Prize. So we're very excited to have him on our panel today. Next, we have Dr. Uh, Carlos Del Rio. He's an interim dean at the Emory University School of Medicine and professor of epidemiology and global health at the Rollins School of Public Health uh, of Emory University. And we're very excited to have him as, as well. Um, and next we have Dr. Neil Vora, a physician with Conservation International, where he leads its efforts on pandemic prevention. Really important to emphasize prevention because a lot of us talk a lot about preparedness. And so I'm excited to get his thoughts on the prevention aspect. Uh, he also served for nearly a decade with the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So thank you all three panelists for joining today's uh, webinar. I think it's a very time topic because H5N1 is constantly in the news and you're seeing sporadic cases here and there throughout the world. So just to give a, a bit of a context and, and, and set the stage, um, I just want to give a quick overview of where we are as we talk about H5N1. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, releases um, you know, ongoing updates and based on their latest technical report um, that they shared on highly pathogenic avian influenza A, H5N1 viruses from October of this year. It shares how since 2022, a small number of human H5N1 cases have been identified, primarily linked to poultry exposure uh, with no mammal to human or human to human transmission detected. The good news is to date, more than 6,550 people in 52 jurisdictions across the United States have been monitored. Um, and uh, so they've been uh, monitored since 2022 and only one human case has been detected. Uh, we know that currently the H5N1 viruses currently infecting birds and poultry, which occasionally spill over to mammals, do not easily bind to human, respect, uh, human respiratory tract receptors, keeping the public risk low. And that's important to emphasize is that the, the public risk currently um, is, uh, is low. The bad news is that there are concerning developments of H5N1s spread among over 200 mammals across 20 species uh, in 26 United States uh, states or territories between 2022 to 2023, and international infections have been reported in various mammals, including farmed mink, foxes, seals, sea lions, and domestic pets in several countries. Hence, due to the virus's potential to evolve and its widespread presence in birds, poultry, and certain mammals, sporadic human infections are expected, uh, ne uh, necessitating continuous global surveillance and preparedness. So that's just giving a little bit of overview of where we are with H5N1. And so I want to turn to um, our panelists and ask this question uh, to all of you. Um, how would you characterize the current and future threat of H5N1? And we'll start with David. We'll go to Carlos and uh, Neil. Well, thank you very much, Syra, and I'm, I'm very glad to be included in this. Um, I, first, I need to make the disclaimer. I am not a, you implied this in the introduction. I'm not a scientist. I'm a, I'm a writer who has written about viruses and other emerging pathogens for the last 20 years, but I work in that, in that zone of communications and understanding between scientists and the general public. And I think that one of the most um, dangerous aspects of the current situation, one of the biggest challenges we face is virus fatigue among the, the general public and distrust of science among the general public coming out of the, as we slowly come out of the COVID-19 experience, we find ourselves, I think, less well prepared to meet 
the challenges of any sort of a pandemic, a pandemic influenza virus or another coronavirus, less prepared than we were four years ago when this thing, COVID-19, got started because there has been so much controversy, so much misinformation, so much confusion about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, its origins and its evolution and its journey through the human population, that now people, the general public, doesn't know what to think about vaccination. We have to deliver the message of how valuable vaccination is, doesn't know what to think about being told there is another new virus and another imminent, perhaps, pandemic that they need to be concerned about. That is a great challenge, and it's one that I think about every day. So the science of Science of the um, of uh, H5N1 and all of its constantly evolving relative strains uh, is difficult enough for scientists to keep track of, still more so for the general public to absorb what it is that scientists such as Carlos and Neil and you are trying to make plain to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely, when during our discussion, we'll want to dive a little bit into the science communication of it all, because that is key. And one of the biggest lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is really how to put the threat in context and then how to actually communicate that science uh, and any public health guidance to the public. So so thank you for that, David. Um, Carlos, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. To me, um, you know, again, having gone through the 2009 uh, influenza pandemic and now COVID, we have to remind ourselves that the avian influenza, highly pathogenic avian influenza pandemic could be really, really deadly. And I think the uh, we are not as prepared as we should be. And in fact, as David mentioned, this this pandemic fatigue, but more importantly, this, this enormous mistrust we have now in our public health agencies and our public health institutions, I think really make us extremely vulnerable to a, uh, to a, a pandemic influenza uh, whether it's you know an H1, H5N1 or some other one. I mean, H5N1, as you had mentioned, has only infected a few humans. It hasn't been human-to-human transmission. But the mortality rate when it's been transmitted is, 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 is close to 50%, right? So obviously, it's, it's a concern to all of us. And I think when I think about how to, what do we need to do, number one, we need to strengthen early detection. We need to have our, our surveillance systems in place so we can actually detect when those cases start to happening. Number two, we need to have... The, the laboratory capacity to do the, the the isolation and the sequencing necessary to be able to detect when somebody, I mean, I personally just recently had a, uh, you know, had influenza despite being vaccinated. I had uh, influenza A. I and I, you know, you always worry when when you have influenza. Well, is this this is this vaccine failure? Or is this or is this uh, you know some other strain that needs to be looked at? And we're not doing that because our our current detection methods which are primarily based on PCR technology and antigen technology, do not allow the viral sequencing that you would like to happen. So we need to have the laboratory capacity strengthening so we can have those isolates and, and look at it. And then we need to have you know, our national you know, stockpile of vaccines and antivirals readily available. And finally, we need to have this rapid communication and access to information that we have told, talked about. And we need to do that in such a way that we are not scaring the public, but actually strengthening the trust of the public in the public in the in the in the public health infrastructure and in the public health uh, authorities because right now i think the lack of trust to me again it is the biggest threat that we have for a really severe pandemic of whether it's covid again or influenza or whatever you want to call it absolutely absolutely L lots a lot of lessons learned um and a lot, lot to discuss here so thank you thank you so much for that um neil Thank you. And hard acts to follow uh, behind uh, the, the two other presenters. But uh, first of all, fully agree with everything that has been said so far. And I am particularly worried, as David was mentioning, that we are less prepared today than we were back in 2019 for another pandemic for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, if you look back from 1918 through up until now, we've had at least six viral pandemics. So four of them were flu pandemics. There was the COVID pandemic, and the sixth one that I'm counting is HIV. Um, five of these six were the result, five of these six, if not all six, were the result of spillover of animal viruses into people. 
through a variety of different mechanisms. And, and we also know that infectious diseases are increasingly emerging because of human activities. And so one of my concerns is that in a lot of these conversations, and I really appreciate some of your introductory remarks, Sarah, is that we often neglect the importance of prevention. We absolutely must be preparing more for the next pandemic, but we also need to be investing in prevention of these spillovers alongside these preparedness efforts because no public health intervention is perfect and the stakes are too high. As we saw with COVID with millions of people dead or from HIV, um, and, and, and so we have to be investing across the board in these efforts. And this is not just an issue of uh, human well-being, but it's also a security issue, right? There's a variety of different perspectives and lenses we can take on this issue. But no matter what lens you're using, it's clear that we must be doing more to address the threat of viruses. Absolutely. I, I think you definitely summarized it perfectly. The, the threat is, is too high and there is a lot that has to be done. Um, I'm going to go back to um, one thing that, that uh, Carlos had mentioned, which is the case fatality rate, um, which is you know nearly or over uh, 50% with eight five on one cases. And we know that that's certainly just the tip of the iceberg in terms of those are the cases that are you know are severe enough to go get hospitalized and unfortunately succumb to the illness. And so uh, you know that maybe the CFR may be lower, maybe higher. We don't exactly know um, in in that term. But um, Carlos, can you share more about the clinical picture of H five N one and potentially the types of signs and symptoms that are associated with these viruses? if there's any specific treatment options. Um, and then if you'd like to also comment on the H5, uh, the H5 candidate vaccine uh, that's expected to provide good protection against the current clade uh, 2.3.4.4B HPAI. Uh, the, the, the clade numbers, you know, it's like similar to the uh, COVID-19 variants. It's very hard to, to keep up with uh, some of these uh, nomenclatures, but love to, love to get your, uh, your perspective on the clinical picture here. Well, again, you know, the, the, the typical symptoms are, could be a, like severe flu, could be pneumonia, but I think what we have seen and what has been described in, in several patients that are things as clinicians we should notice is, is the presence of GI symptoms like diarrhea tends to be very common. And the other one is, is conjunctivitis. That's the other thing that you, you tend to see. And again, there's a lot of people out there with pink eye, not all pink eye is, is kind of pathogenic influenza, but I think the combination of of a severe respiratory uh, syndrome that goes all the way to, I mean, to acute you know, respiratory distress and, and intubation and severe pneumonia accompanied by diarrhea and conjunctivitis in somebody who has recent exposure to, to, a, to a bird, you know, or to, to a wild bird uh, would make me think about, about uh, highly pathogenic uh, influenza. The, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the symptom onset is very severe. It's very rapid. It's it's not something that that goes on. It's it's almost everybody with influenza, you know, starts by saying, "Hey, I was feeling well until you know, midnight last night, and all of a sudden I started having chills and I started getting bad." And and then the progression of the disease is very rapid. And that's the other thing that again, when you get a history of somebody who's progressed very rapidly to ARDS, you got to think about the syndromes. So so it is the it is a combination of a respiratory GI and, and 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 mucosal findings such as conjunctivitis, the sudden onset and the and the rapid progression that are things that I worry about and that at least make you should make you suspicious of the possibility of highly pathogenic influenza. Uh, we we what we know about the vaccine that currently stockpiled the H five N one vaccine that is currently ex stock stockpiled is that it seems to have fairly good uh, coverage and fairly good protection against the current circulating strain. But again, we must remember that this, you know, just like we learned in COVID, you know, influenza strains continuously are changing and are mutating. And as you mentioned, the, uh, the current uh, attachment of the, of the H5 uh, uh, hemagglutinin to the respiratory uh, tract silic acid of humans is not very good, but the virus can mutate and then become highly uh, capable of attaching in which case we don't know what the vaccine coverage is going to be, and we don't know how the efficacy of the vaccine is going to be. You know, fortunately, we we have new technology. I mean, I think I'll remember, I'd never forget 2009 when by the time we had isolated the virus and we were ready to produce vaccines, the egg production capacity was already dedicated to the, to the endemic vaccine, and there was no way to produce a new vaccine rapidly because we had to wait for, for you know, hence to have new eggs. With mRNA technology, we can do that very quickly. And I, I think one of the good things about the COVID pandemic is how we, we have 
really developed novel ways of developing vaccines and the old ways of developing influenza vaccines simply would not be, you know, by the time we had the H5, I mean, by the time we had the N1, the H5, the H1N1, uh, you know, pandemic flu vaccine of 2009, the pandemic was over, right? We, it, it, it came too late. And I think with mRNA technology, that's not going to be the case. So, so I feel good about that. Absolutely. And it makes me think of, you know, in the, in the national biodefense strategy, um, one point where it mentions, you know, having a vaccine ready within 100 days of detection. So I really hope that, you know, that does come into play in the event that it is needed. I do believe we have the science and the technology to make that happen. It's really all about willpower uh, and, and politics, right, to make sure that that actually occurs and the funding behind it. So I think there's ambitious goals and they are certainly are achievable, but making sure that there's political will and, and funding to back that in the event that that is needed um, in, in the future. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, Carlos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pose a question to, to David. So in your book, Spillover, which I have you know, very much enjoyed reading a, a few years ago, you discuss various zoonotic diseases. Based on your extensive research, how does the H5N1 virus compare historically to other zoonotic diseases in terms of its potential for widespread impact to humans? Well, compared to things like, uh, you know, Neil mentioned HIV AIDS, which has killed, the, what is it, 35 million, close to 40 million people at this point, and the 1918 influenza, which we don't know how many people it killed, maybe 50 million is a rough estimate. Um, this um, H5N1, H5 lineage, um, bird flu has the potential to be that bad or worse, potentially much worse. Now that we have 8 billion humans on this planet living at high density and very much interconnected um, by transportation means, and we have the birds themselves carrying this flu around the world. I mean, influenza's, um, influenza viruses travel around the world two ways. They travel in airplanes and they travel in birds um, and they get around quickly because of that. I think of this, <clears throat> this H5 lineage uh, bird flu as, um, as, as a potential threat that could be much worse than anything we have seen um, in certainly in the last 120 years. I think of it as a uh, well, there's the issue of transmission. We've talked about case fatality rate in humans, which is very high. Transmissibility from human to human is the missing piece so far. This virus is out there. It's circulating. It can be very lethal to humans. It does not transmit at all well from human to human. I think of it as, as a revolver, and the revolver is loaded. The revolver is cocked. The revolver is aimed at the global human population. And what remains is the trigger pull. And achieving mutations or reassortments of gene segments that would give this virus effective transmissibility from human to human, that's the trigger pull. And we hope that trigger won't be pulled, but if it is, it's gonna be horrible. Absolutely. I think you hit the hit the nail on the head as we talk about transmissibility. And I'm gonna uh, pose this question to, to Neil. Um, so, you know, you, your work uh, focuses a lot on pandemic prevention, which is amazing because a lot of the work that many of us often do is on the preparedness end, but prevention is certainly the golden standard and a key. Do you think it's too late to prevent H5N1 from potentially moving to the human population causing sustained human to human transmission? Thanks, Sarah. Um... Yeah, some sobering remarks from David just now, and I fully agree. We are facing a potential catastrophic threat of astronomical proportions. And we, again, need to be investing in all areas to reduce our vulnerability to this threat and to reduce the threat itself. And when it comes to reducing the threat itself, that's where what I'm talking about comes into play. That is by reducing the risk of that virus, developing the mutations, that will allow it to transmit between people and also reducing the opportunities for that virus to jump into people. There are a number of human activities that put us at increased risk for a variety of emerging infectious diseases, whether we're talking about the commercial wildlife trade in urban settings that probably led, almost certainly led to the COVID pandemic, um, to land use change in the form of deforestation, 
to high intensity industrial scale animal farms. And when it comes to avian foods, it's really that high industrial, the, 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 the industrialized high density animal farms where we need to be putting more investment into, right? So building up the workforce, the veterinary workforce around the world so that we have healthcare, so that we have healthcare workers that deal with the animals that can help us address that threat. We need to be resourcing these farms so that they have the prior biosecurity measures so that when people are working with, for example, chickens that are being raised to feed people, because we need to feed people, and food security is a major issue around the world and people are not getting enough protein in certain parts of the world, right? So we absolutely need to be figuring out how can we raise these farmed animals in safer ways. For example, making sure that farm workers have access to pro personal protective equipment, making sure that these animals, such as chickens, get vaccinated for, for example, Newcastle disease or for avian flu in certain instances. We also have to be thinking about activities that humans are engaging in that might not be so important. Think about mink farms. Minks are raised for the fur industry, not to feed people. And we have to be asking ourselves, why are we raising minks when they pose such a big risk for fueling the next pandemic. We saw during the COVID pandemic that minks are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, the agent of COVID, and that SARS-CoV-2 can then could then be passed from minks into people. In fact, there was even the de detection of novel variants of SARS-CoV-2 in the setting of those mink farms that experienced outbreaks. And when those outbreaks occurred on those mink farms, tens of thousands, if not more, minks had to be culled to address that threat. We are now also seeing H5N1 emerge on mink farms yet again. And minks are an animal that have a distribution of receptors that the influenza virus can latch onto that is similar to people. So we are, we are creating the perfect conduit for a virus from birds to jump into mink and then on into people. And every time these vir viruses pass that species barrier, it increases the probability that they will gain new mutations that will increase their virulence. And the final point I'll make here is that, again, minks, um, we, we're already seeing that there's evidence of mink to mink transmission of H5N1, right? So we are getting closer and closer to that precipice that could have catastrophic consequences. And we have to think about the activities that we are doing as humans that are increasing that risk. And that's what I mean by prevention, right? So alongside all the important things that Carlos has mentioned about preparing for the next flu pandemic, we also have to be thinking about what else can we be doing to reduce that threat in the first place? And Sarah, if I, I can add quickly to what Neil just said, talking about intensive industrial scale um, livestock grazing, chickens, for instance, we now, last time I checked, uh, we have 33 billion chickens on this planet at a given moment. And in the course of a year, because there's turnover, there are something like 70 billion chickens that move through mostly large scale chicken raising operations. Those operations are petri dishes for the evolution of a bird flu virus such as this one. We are offering that virus these countless millions, millions, millions of opportunities to rep, well, trillions and trillions of opportunities to replicate uh, and potentially acquire mutations and reassort and acquire gene segments that might make it transmissible from human to human. And as Neil says, we need to do one aspect of preparedness is to is to reorganize the way um, livestock is raised for feeding people on this planet. No, absolutely. absolutely. And I think the other thing is that, again, we frequently have livestock in which we have, you know, birds together with pigs in, in the same in the same environment. And that's exactly how the recombination happens and then leads to increasing the transmission to humans. So again, a lot of it is we need to do better prevention and we need to do better surveillance in, in the in the livestock industry. And, and, and we really have it preventing, as Neil reminded us, all the pandemics we've seen are, are zoonoses and we need to do a better job in, in, in having and in working with our veterinarian colleagues and people working in the animal uh, industry in order to uh, to really truly have a true uh, pandemic influenza preparedness plan. 
Sarah, can I just add one more thing? Because this is such a good balancing oh, of ideas. Keep it going, yeah. Um, you know, there is so much focus on the threat of lab leaks and lab accidents. And don't get me wrong, we need to be investing in that as well. But this, what I am concerned about, and other people have said this before, I'm not the first one to say this, but what we are allowing to happen in these highly intensive farm settings without proper biosecurity in mink farms is a gain of function experiment that is uncontrolled and not regulated. That is far more dangerous than anything that happens in many of the laboratories around the world by trained scientists in a very controlled setting. And we are misdirecting our attention when right now something very dangerous is about to jump over into people, right? So so we have to, to remember that that is a gain of function exper experiment. Just like Carlos said, we're putting these species together. And when one animal gets, si particularly a pig or a mink, gets infected simultaneously by a human influenza virus or a swine influenza virus and H5N1, it creates that opportunity for those virus, those two different viruses to mix and create a novel virus that could be the start of the next pandemic. I love I love this conversation. I think it's it's so, so uh, important. And thank you all for raising those really important points and consideration. And I want to talk a little bit more on the ecological aspect and the different factors um, that's contributing. And what it's also reminding me of, Neil, as you as you mentioned, what's happening, you know, certainly in the real world is the, the 2012 moratorium that was placed on uh, H5N1 research in particular, if you all remember the, the scientists who were, were studying it um, in Ferris and, and, the, and the like, and there was a moratorium that put a pause on it. But this is happening in, in nature, right? Um, right now. So really important to put the, the risks in, in perspective here. Um, based on some of the uh, ecological factors, do you think that particularly here in the United States, we're doing enough, um, you know, you know, with some of the factors you raised, Neil, is there things that we should be doing more of? So as we look at what other countries are doing with animal vaccinations, do you think that we should be doing more uh, to ensure that we're preventing, you know, hu the transmission to humans? Uh so I, I have, I'm a medical doctor. I still see patients one day a week in, in a tuberculosis clinic. I used to work for the CDC. And I'm so happy that, I wish it did not take COVID, but I'm so happy that at least we're talking more about public health than we ever have before, at least in recent decades. Um, but I am very concerned that the conversation is often skewed towards post spillover, meaning after the virus has already emerged in humans, what we need to do. And again, the the threat is too big for us to be, implementing incomplete solutions to pandemics. We need all options on the menu. We need to be considering everything. Uh, I, I will also add that many of the interventions to prevent these spillovers from addressing the, the biosecurity issues on farms to addressing deforestation, to addressing um, wildlife markets and trade, many of these interventions have other co-benefits, particularly for climate change, and for biodiversity. We are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And climate change is probably the greatest threat to human health we face in the next century. And the loss of biodiversity, which we do not talk nearly about, enough about, is an existential risk to humanity. We depend upon nature for our survival. And so every dollar spent in preventing these spillovers is a dollar that goes a long way because not only does it help us prevent the next pandemic, it also helps us mitigate climate change and address the loss of biodiversity. We need to be thinking across sectors. The, we often reward re training in reductive areas, deep expertise, and there's a lot of value in that, but the solutions to the existential threats we face from climate change, the loss of biodiversity and pandemics are not gonna be found in any single discipline. It will take people across disciplines working together. So bottom line to answer your question, no, I do not think we are doing enough. We need to be doing far more and for whatever the reason, when it comes to security issues, biological threats do not get nearly the attention that other security threats get. And that deeply concerns me. I agree. These are national security threats. Bio threats are national security threats. We've seen this from COVID-19. Um, and we don't have to look too far because we're experiencing it right now. So, so thank you so much, Neil, for sharing those um, 
wise uh, words. I'm gonna uh, go over to, to David. So I wanna focus a little bit on the public communication and awareness piece. So presently H5N1 viruses found in birds are considered uh, to present a low threat to the general United States population. Nonetheless, individuals um, with occupational or recreational contact with infected birds are at increased risk and should follow the recommended CDC safety measures that they have shared on their website. In your experience as a science writer, how can complex information about threats like H5N1 be effectively communicated to the public to raise awareness without causing unnecessary um, alarm? And obviously, as a threat evolves, how to share that information? Well, it's increasingly difficult to communicate about science to the general public and increasingly important. And I suppose the the, the simplest answer I can give, Sarah, is storytelling. Um, people who occupy my particular um, niche in this whole area, those who um, listen to scientists and talk to the general public about what scientists are, are learning and thinking and doing, uh, we have to do more than explain science. Um, we have to tell stories about science and the scientists who do it. We have to help people understand not just what science says, but what science is. And this has become particularly important uh, and more difficult over the last four years because of um, because of the because of misinformation on social media and elsewhere. Um, suddenly, uh, everybody became an expert on COVID nineteen. If you followed the subject on Twitter uh, and and there was a terrible blurring and a terrible increase in confusion and distrust. So in terms of communicating with the general public, we science communicators need to need to be aware of that and deal with that. Um, we need to be extremely factual, extremely conscientious about accuracy, extremely devoted to empirical evidence, and yet we need to tell stories that have narrative arcs, that have human characters, that help people understand that science is not a body of discoveries and knowledge that is frozen and static, but a process of movement toward gradually toward more and more accurate understanding of the physical world and how it works. And if people understand that, then they won't be inclined to become so cynical when science is saying one thing in February of 2020 and a slightly different thing in May of 2020, whether that's about masks or about airborne transmission of the COVID virus, or whether it's an advisory from, from Tony Fauci or whatever, people get confused when they see science saying, well, our best knowledge in February was this, but now we realize that a more accurate answer is this in May. That's part of science. That's part of the story. It's supposed to happen that way. That is the self-correcting um, process of scientific discovery. So we, we, science, we science writers need to tell that story better, more clearly, and more entertainingly. You know, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to be entertaining about a global catastrophe that affects 600 million people and kills 6 million, but you still have to do it. You have to have to make reading about even something as horrible as the AIDS pandemic or the COVID pandemic. You have to make that for general, for the general public, you have to make it in some way, God forbid, a guilty pleasure so that people will not tune out, will not say, I have COVID fatigue, just don't even tell me about it anymore, and don't start with this bird flu thing. It has to be a story of, of wonder and discovery and heroism and human frailty and changing knowledge, as well as an explication of um, what the difference is between reassortment and recombination. I love that strategy. David, I think I, I, love, I love what you said. You're absolutely right, and this is such a an important thing to do, right? I mean, we have to 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 make science something that people uh, appreciate and and get hooked on, right? Just like, I mean, 
we need a, not only do we need new authors, but we also need writers of TV shows and other things. We need a Netflix series about about this kind of stuff. We need really people to yeah. to to get attached to that 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 discovery and, and understand it and uh, and really uh, and and really you know understand the complexities. But but I also think we as scientists need to need to be. I think one thing this this pandemic has taught us and has taught me very importantly is is we need to be more humble. And we need to be. We need to also be able to say the words "I don't know." And there are many times that that the most important thing that I can tell an interviewer, it was when they ask, "How about this?" I would say, "I don't know." This is, in the best of my knowledge, this is what we recommend, but we really don't know the answer. We're still looking at it, and and we have become sometimes too dogmatic. As science is not black and white, and becoming dogmatic, I think, has has hurt us. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important uh, in terms of what you mentioned, Carlos, is that science is not black and white. And so trying to communicate that gray area is really important. And as you've highlighted, really being humble and sharing the truth. You don't know, but this is based on, you know, what we have know so far, this is what it is and it can change. And we certainly learned that the hard way during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I hope that as we look at future health threats, that we take those lessons learned and, and communicate much more effectively with the public and, and try to reestablish some of that trust that we lost during the COVID-19 pandemic, because that's really going to be one of the, the breaking uh, and making factors um, as we respond to future outbreaks is building back that trust in the public and making sure we can communicate effectively. So, so thank you for highlighting that. Anything you want to add to that, Neil? I know you're also an amazing science communicator, but I think we definitely talk about some of the high points. And I think storytelling is certainly really, really important. Um, Carlos, I'm going to um, turn to you. So despite the widespread global currents of H5N1 and birds, uh, you know, there have been a, a few human infections, as we as we mentioned, since 2022. And they've all been linked to poultry exposure with no human to human transmission repu uh, reported. Drawing from the COVID-19 experience, uh, what are the critical lessons that can be applied to managing the threat of H5N1 should sustained human to human transmission occur, particularly in terms of, you know, clinical management and healthcare system response? Boy, that's a, that's a tough one, right? Because when I think about when I think about a case, if we were to have here in Atlanta a case of H five N one, we would probably manage it the same way we manage uh, persons with Ebola. We would probably put them in our in our uh, serious communicable disease unit. We will do a high level, uh, you know, pa consequence pathogen isolation, and we will will probably contain it there. But once you start having sustained human to human transmission, once you hit that component, and then you go, it almost reminds me in early COVID, our, 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 our scientists that work in our SCDU started to try to put COVID in the SCDU, but obviously it very rapidly went into the community that was, it went into all our wards and went everywhere, right? And that's when you have to really do what you can to, to limit transmission in healthcare settings. And, we, and if we go back to the, not COVID, but the, the SARS, the first SARS epidemic, a lot of the transmission occurred in healthcare settings. A lot yeah. of transmission in Toronto and many other cities occur in healthcare. So we really need to emphasize the importance of, of uh, you know, personal protective equipment. We need really need to uh, import, uh, you know, remind uh, healthcare workers about the importance of masking, and we really need to again uh, and do all the necessary things to contain this within the healthcare system. And you know, again, the lack of trust right now. In the value of masks, to me, is just fascinating because, you know, I tell people, look, you know, throughout the COVID pandemic, I was seeing persons with COVID. I was enrolling people in clinical trials. I was wearing masks. I never got infected. I got infected when I was in a social event in, in June of, of, of 2022 or 2021, 2022. So again, you know, it is, it is outside of healthcare where I got infected, where I wasn't wearing a mask, but I was wearing, you know, not only an N95, many times I was wearing a well, you know, a, a well-fitted, well-put, you know, surgical mask, and that was sufficient to to prevent me from getting infected. So we have to remind people about the importance of personal protective equipment, and we have to remind hospitals about the importance of of not breaking that. Because again, in Ebola, we saw the transmission that occurred in Dallas, for example, uh, to healthcare workers. So it really is reminding our healthcare workers continuously about the importance of personal protective equipment and how to use it. Absolutely. 
I was I was part of the bio threat team in Texas uh, when when Ebola occurred in, in 2014, and I think you raised a really important concept where during Ebola the the strategy was containment. It wasn't mitigation. We didn't want it spreading in the community. We wanted to contain the small isolated cases that we had to make sure it doesn't. We don't see you know ongoing human to human transmission. And I think the goal is going to be very similar to H5N1 uh, as we utilize these biocontainment units throughout the United States. Should we start seeing um, you know, a small number of cases because it should be containment versus just mitigating the threat uh, in the community. But if we do start seeing ongoing transmission, that's going to be very difficult because we only have a handful of these BCUs with a handful of, of beds that are available. So I think the initial strategy will likely be containment. And if things get out of control, then it's going to certainly transition into mitigation then. Um, so thank you for, for highlighting that, that important point. Um, I'm going to go over to, to David, and I really enjoyed also your New York Times essay from October of 2022. It was titled, uh, A Dolphin, A Porpoise, and Two Men Got Bird Flu. That's a warning to the rest of us. So in that piece, you mentioned the concept of viral chatter and its significance and understanding disease transmission between species. Could you elaborate on how this concept helps us gauge the risk of viruses like H5N1 crossing over from animals to humans and then you know sustained human-to-human -human transmission? And what recent instances like the cases of the bottlenose uh, dolphin and the porpoise tell us about the evolving nature of this threat? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Viral chatter, it's a concept that originates, as far as I know, with a, a, a wonderful disease scientist named Don Burke. Um, formerly, um, he's now retired from being Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh, if I recall. Before that, for for decades, he was an, an AIDS researcher for the US military. Um, and I talked with Don Burke back in about 2010, the first time when I was researching my book, Spillover. Um, and I asked him about, I asked him among other things about, is there a, a new pandemic coming? And if so, what will it look like? And he told me, yeah, it'll be a single stranded RNA uh, virus, uh, coming out of a wild animal, possibly a bat in some place such as, you know, a wet market. Um, and what kind of a single-stranded RNA virus? Well, it might be a, an influenza virus, it might be a coronavirus. This is 2010, he's telling me all these things. And then he says, I'm not a prophet. These are just, these are just obvious things. Uh, and then he, he described this phenomenon that he calls viral chatter, which is essentially the the intermittent recurrent spillover of a dangerous virus from a wild animal a zoonotic source into a human victim with little or no onward transmission so you have a case you have a case of somebody who's got bird flu or a new coronavirus and uh, and you manage to contain it you say well that problem is solved that was scary and then Five months later, in some other part of the world, you have another case. Um, again, no onward transmission. And then you have another case um, with maybe one or two um, onward transmissions, and then you contain it. This is viral chatter. This is a situation, a pattern that is telling you that this particular virus is ready to go big in the human population. Viruses don't have intentions, they don't have wants, but metaphorically speaking, this virus this virus wants to become a human pathogen and it keeps having opportunities to spill over from its zoonotic reservoir host into humans because of the way neil has talked about this eloquently of the way we are conducting ourselves in terms of um, the disruption of biological diversity and the intensive animal husbandry of of creatures that can be intermediate hosts so viral chatter is the warning that this new virus X is getting too many opportunities for comfort to spill over into humans. It's not yet evolved, adapted to become transmissible human to human, but each time another of these events occurs, that's another opportunity. So viral chatter, uh, that's what we're seeing with, uh, with H5 influenza now. The occasional case in humans around the world, more than occasional cases of spilling over from birds into mammals, marine mammals, sea lions, elephant seals, um, scavengers, foxes, um, uh, the fur trade, 
um, mink, as Neil has said. We're in the stage of viral chatter with this particular virus now, and uh, and we need to take that very, very seriously. You know, one thing, I, I agree 100%, David, and, and I think as you were talking, one thing that I started to think about and, and what Neil has said also about industry is frequently we we do recommendations in public health that actually negatively impact the economy, right? And negatively impact an industry. And therefore we're not, and some people, at least during COVID, we saw this, it was public health versus the economy. And we were not able to make the connection that we need strong public health in order for the economy to thrive. So it's also working with those industries to try to say, look, by doing the following things, by doing the following investments, we can actually make your industry better and your industry stronger and your industry more resilient to a spillover phenomena and to an emerging virus. And, and, and that may require investment that needs to come from the government or from other agencies, but, but it is so important that we, we make the industries uh, resilient and capable to, 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 to withstand the impact of a pandemic rather than going and shutting things down. Because I think one of the things that got very negative impact, uh, you know, sort of public perception of public health was the idea that we went around shutting things down, right? And, and when the reality is that, that shutting things down temporarily made sense, but when you do that for, for long periods of time, you adversely impact the economy and therefore people are not gonna be receptive to those kinds of interventions. Yeah. That's great. And I'm glad you highlight those false dichotomies that was very prevalent during the COVID-19 pandemic and how we need to make sure that we we look at that and do a better job with communicating that information to the... To uh, the could I add just a word to that? Yeah, what Carlos just said? Um, part of this, and I agree totally with, with what Carlos just said, and part of the problem is that um, political leaders believe that prevention is prohibitively expensive if, if it runs to tens of billions of dollars to reorganize our food production systems or, and, and institute uh, highly in, intensive um, proactive surveillance. Seems expensive, um, but tens of billions of dollars is chicken feed compared to the expenses of response, the expenses of pandemic when it's suddenly it's tens of trillions of dollars. Um, but politicians act um, generally, political leaders act on the basis of um, what's going to happen with some certainty between now and the next election. I don't want to seem too cynical about that, um, but that is the framework of incentive within which they work. And the scientists can't say this next pandemic will happen between now and the next election. They can only say that prevention might cost tens of billions of dollars. Yes, that is expensive, but not nearly as expensive as the, the costs that we pay um, if a pandemic does occur. You know, uh, just, just to finalize on that or to compliment on that, you just reminded me, one of my friends and public health heroes, uh, uh, Bill Fage, uh, always likes to quote uh, Dolly Parton saying, you know, you have no idea how expensive it is to look this cheap, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one that comes to mind is you know announce that prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I think it's it's never been more more accurate. Um, but well that's that's great. Um so uh, I'm gonna have a final question to Neil and then we're gonna look into the chat box. I know there's a couple of questions coming in and for the audience, feel free to put any additional questions in the chat box and we'll pose it to our panelists um, as we have time. So um, Neil, I just want to touch up on the international collaboration piece because we talk obviously a lot about domestic and what we need to do. But this is a worldwide uh, threat, um, not just here domestically in the United States. In your opinion, how crucial is international collaboration in managing the threat of H5N1? And what are any steps you think should be taken to enhance global cooperation in this area? Well, uh, as Tom Frieden often says, and I think others do as well, a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. We live in an interconnected world. We travel around the world, many of us on airplanes or trains or whatever it is. And so a pathogen that emerges in one part of the world can very quickly within hours be on the exact opposite end of the world and spreading. And again, part of my concern is that if you only focus on quick detection and trying to contain the virus, well, for some of these viruses, the cat is already out of the bag once it is spilled over. For example, let's say a virus has the capability to spread before a person shows any symptoms. Well, in that case, if a person gets infected, 
and jumps on an airplane and is shedding the virus asymptomatically, while other people will be getting sick simultaneously, and there will be explosive spread of the virus, despite having very good surveillance and very, very good healthcare systems, right? So we have to be investing across the board in prevention and preparedness. Uh, we have to be making sure those investments happen around the world. Uh, I, I, I want to also be very clear on your point about international collaboration. Many of the of the pressures that lead to the emergence of pathogens, even though these pathogens might be emerging, for example, in the tropics of the world, those pressures are still ultimately coming from Europe and the United States, where our economic systems and our demand for commodities leads to the extraction of resources elsewhere in the world. And so it's easy to point fingers, but we have to be honest about these threats and uh, where they are emerging from and thinking about it holistically. So, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a very strong rationale for why higher income countries in the world must be investing in the public health infrastructure and other one health capacities around the world um, because higher income countries have just as much to benefit from those investments as other parts of the world. And I just made this argument from a self-interested perspective and an economic perspective. And, and I think um, David and Carlos's points before about the cost savings of prevention were very important. But I would also add an equity lens to this. The reality is, is that the tools that we use to contain these pathogens from spreading, such as vaccines or medicines or even information, are inequitably distributed. Whereas when you, when you prevent the emergence in the first place, everyone benefits everywhere, right? So there's a strong equity reason why we also must be investing in prevention. But I also understand that given the way the world works, uh, these moralistic arguments might not be compelling enough, unfortunately. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's so important. I'm really glad you highlighted that prevention is for all, right? And then unfortunately, when we get into the response phase, there's a number of health inequities that we often deal with. And we've seen that during COVID, we've seen that during multiple different outbreaks, even with MPOX. So, so thank you so much, Neil, for, for sharing that. So a uh, question in the in the chat box, and if any of the panelists wanted to answer it, uh, the question is beyond the need for biosurveillance data, often less is stated about actionable frameworks needed to analyze and decide what to do with these data. For example, whether to begin a vaccine development campaign, diagnostic developments and therapeutics. What is uh, ne needed from policymakers and funding agencies to finalize this process? Anyone wanna take a shot at that? Carlos? Uh, Well, I, I think I think what's needed is, is is information, is data, right? And at the end of the day, is really is when do you pull the trigger, and and how do you how do you decide that it's time to to release a, a vaccine from a stockpile to to develop a new new strategies? But I also think that we have to, to continuously be be encouraging the development of new therapies, of new approaches, of new new uh, new therapeutics. I you know I think for example you know that the drugs we currently have for COVID are 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 not the best drugs that there should be, right? And and I feel sometimes that, you know, they're the AZT of HIV world, right? I mean, you know, with with, with further development and therapeutics. So we need to continue to invest in the basic development of vaccines and therapeutics. But at the same time, we have to have the policymakers understand that stockpiling this 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 tools is actually cost effective because it's like having your fire department functioning. You know, you need to have your fire department ready to take care of a fire, and you need to have it well stocked and 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 well well ready, well prepared. And that again brings me to back to to I know we're all tired, but at some point in time, pretty soon, we're going to have to start getting back into doing you know pandemic, you know, pulling out revised pandemic preparedness plans and doing you know desktop exercises and how do we deal with this and what happens if there's a a new case of H5N1 that is detected in New York City. What is the response? How do we get ready? So, so when the when this happens, the policymakers know exactly what to do, and they're not asking questions then. Can I can I also add to that very quickly, Sarah? Which is, um, as the data emerge from various parts of the world, there's also an inequity in the ability to analyze the data. Much of the analysis, much of the data, even if it gets derived from countries that are lower income, the data get exported to higher income countries. And that's an inequity right there, right? We need to be making sure that there's capacity built around the world to analyze the data, number one. Number two is that we need to make sure that the benefits of sharing those data are also 
e- equitably distributed. All too often, we've seen vaccine hoarding. We saw this in COVID. We've seen this with MPOX, where even as the data are emerging from countries that are lower income, the benefits are still experienced in countries that are higher income. And uh, the third point I would make here is that we need to make sure that we don't have uh, knee-jerk responses that actually hurt the ultimate response. We saw when Omicron emerged, I think it was in 2021. Now I'm forgetting exactly the year. Um, as, As it emerged and countries in Southern Africa reported the emergence of this new variant, the reaction was to close borders to those countries in Southern Africa. And at that point, the cat was already out of the bag, right? And those countries were penalized for disclosing information. And to me, that's a grave inequity. And so we need to be a little bit more rational in our approaches. And we need to be doing everything we can to support the training of young students in molecular biology, virology in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Thailand and Laos. Um, just, just yeah. in the spirit of what Nia was just saying, we need to we need to find ways that we in in high income countries can encourage the the training, capacity building, education of top flight molecular virologists, more of them, there's there are people already there, but we need to support them um, producing um, a, a much larger class of um, well-trained scientists in those places so that the work can be done in its entirety in those places. Absolutely. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, So I'm going to have a final question for for all of you all, and then we'll wrap it up. So, And as you answer the final question, uh, feel free to to add any closing remarks. And um, I'll I'll just quickly mention, Carlos, actually here um, within our health system at New York City Health and Hospitals, we ran a H5N1 tabletop exercise earlier this year to talk about should this uh, event occur and we see sustained human to human transmission, what should the healthcare response be? So there's a lot of work cut out, uh, you know, where we just finalized the after action report, but it really highlights the need that we need to to really talk more about this and have additional discussions and better response strategies. And, and to that point, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more on um, the role of healthcare providers and how they can contribute to early detection and response to potential outbreaks. And particularly as we talk about H5N1, if you want to highlight anything um, on that end. Well, absolutely. I think I think all healthcare providers need to be aware. They need to be uh, continuously looking for information. They need to be uh, getting up to date. This kind of webinar, I think, is incredibly useful for them. But they also need to be aware of the of the unusual, right? I, I always think that it is that 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 sentinel, that that curious mind. I remember when Dr. Uh, Bush you know, looked at a gram stain of a CSF and said, hey, that looks like anthrax. And that was the initial detection of the case of anthrax, right? It is that that unusual, that person with the inquisitive mind who says something that doesn't make sense here that then leads to the discovery of something happening. So my advice to, to, to healthcare providers is, is always be on your toes and always keep your eyes open because you never know what's going to come in front of you. And if you're not curious and if you don't have your eyes open, and you don't question uh, what's happening, uh, you will miss the obvious and you will miss things. Uh, not uncommonly, I'll be rounding and you know, a, a young resident will say, well, this is the first case of this that I've seen. And I say, well, imagine how many have seen you so far and you just didn't recognize it, you didn't see it. So, so be, be curious and, and look for the unusual. And when you don't know something, uh, you know, when something just doesn't fit the norm, question it, right? I mean, I think about those two initial Kids that that were led to the to the to the detection of a, of a H H one N one during the two thousand and nine pandemic. Uh, somebody in California said, "Hey, something is unusual here. We have two two young children who have uh, first of all in the in the testing equipment they didn't fit. It didn't it, something was unusual. So they sent this, the strains for sequencing. But then after the sequencing, somebody said, "Hey, this looks like swine flu. Yet these kids had no exposure to swine. Something is going on." So, so be curious, have your eyes open, question things, and work with, with I think, you know, we continue to have public health here and, and clinical medicine here. We need public health and clinical medicine to be closer together in order to really have this. This is a marriage that, that needs to happen in order to make us all stronger. Absolutely. And there's often that blur between public health and healthcare, but certainly in these instances, we absolutely have to work together and, and collaborate because- Absolutely. Know. 
this is essential. Thank you so much for that, Carlos. So uh, just the last question for you, David, and feel free to you know end with your parting thoughts. And then Neil had to hop off, uh, so we wish him well. Um, just wanted to uh, hone in on the global health policy piece, if you wanted to mention anything on it. So considering, obviously, the global nature of zoonotic diseases and H5N1, what policy strategies do you believe are crucial for countries to implement in preparing for potential outbreaks of sustained human-to-human -human transmission with H5N1? Well, I'll say a little bit of that, Sarah, but first I, I should say I'm not a policy person. That's not my strong suit. Uh, so I, I I will say things that um, are perhaps not original and I won't go into depth, but um, as my two good colleagues here have, have said over and over, we need um, we need both prevention and surveillance detection of, of spillover events so that we can decrease the number of spillover events all of which result generally from human in, disruptive human actions with wildlife and uh, and massively industrial scale uh, livestock raising. And we need um, surveillance and containment and scientific data gathering and analysis and vaccine and uh, drug development capacities spread around the world, not just in the, in the wealthy countries, so that we can prevent each spillover that does happen from becoming a sizable outbreak. We can prevent outbreaks from becoming epidemics. We can prevent epidemics from becoming a pandemic. That's difficult, but it is doable. Um, and to that, I'd just like to add one thing, which is that, um, again, from where I sit as an in-between person between science and the general public, I would say to scientists, and I, I suspect that they're perhaps most of our audience today, you're, you're gathering here, may be disease scientists themselves. The scientists here, whether they're academic or agency people, that it's important for you to communicate with the general public somehow about your work. And yet scientists jobs are very difficult um, and all consuming. My niche, people like me stand there ready to be an intermediary but you shouldn't be overly trusting and overly generous with your time. You can communicate with the general public through science writers, through journalists, through authors, uh, but hold them to a high standard. Um, give your time and your trust to those within this particular guild who come to you with reasonable requests, who have done their homework, who you have reason to believe will be extremely conscientious about accuracy, will check facts with you and will get it right so that they will accurately deliver your message to the general public rather than further blurring the waters. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for those remarks, David and Carlos. Uh, thank you so much for joining as well. So that's going to conclude our, our webinar today. So I appreciate everyone's time. And we just scratched the surface. A lot more obviously has to be done. A lot more has to be discussed. But, you know, the, the threat is real. The stakes are, are high. So, uh, you know, we hope that uh, a lot uh, more discussions happen and that translate into, into you know, more actionable um, next steps and the like. So thank you both. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank mm -hmm. you all who have joined as an audience.